The death of George Floyd under the knee of a white policeman has started a flood of protest around the world. Outrage over an American tragedy. And tens of thousands of people in the UK have marched in unison. But what now? Is it time for us to face our own ugly truth? In the UK, black people are also struggling to breathe and dying under the knees of the police. People think it's happening in America, it's not happening here. I just want people to know that it's happening here all the time. My face was on the floor of a cell. Half of my shirt is covered with blood and my breathing was cutting off. I didn't think I was going to survive. Why are black Britons more likely to be the subject to police force, to die in police custody? Some officers are treating people as if they are subhuman. They are performing their discriminatory behaviour within the police service and they should be removed. Met Police was institutionally racist. And in some ways it got worse than it was 20 odd years ago. Can this movement really end the injustice that has scarred generations? A night of protest in Hackney, East London, after Rashan Charles, a 20-year-old black man, died following contact with the police. He loved football. Um, he was a playful youngster. And then when he got older, he became a problem. And uh, he needed additional guidance. I gave what I could. My father gave a lot of input into him. Rashan was a proud father himself, of a daughter who wasn't even two years old when his life was ended. In the early hours of the 22nd of July 2017, Rashan was running away from a police officer when he entered a grocery store in Hackney. CCTV footage shows him placing something in his mouth before the officer catches up with him. Seconds later, he's forcefully restrained and thrown to the floor. Holding Rasham by the throat, the officer tries to open his mouth. A member of the public assists by placing Rashan in a body hold. Rashan is held down for two minutes before he stops moving. He died later in hospital. I've watched the video so many times now that it's playing in my mind as I speak to you. I don't need to view it again. Uh, I've seen members of my family who are broken people because of what's happened. Rashan's great uncle Rod is a former police chief inspector who still trains new Met recruits on how to detain and restrain suspects. I stand firmly with any officer who has to use lethal force or the highest levels of force when it's appropriate. They have my back in and they should have yours. But when you're talking about a scene that I watch where there isn't a clear and obvious threat to the officer, certainly no threat to bystanders, the levels of resistance from Rashan, if I'm generous, the levels of resistance are negligible. They really are zero. Yet you watch the use of force continue to climb and he died, and I say, I know it was needless. Rashan is one of over 160 people to have died after contact with the police during the last decade. The UK has a long legacy of black deaths in police custody. Black people are twice as likely to die where force has been used. Black people make up 3% of the population, but 8% of the people that die in custody. There can only be one reason, that either consciously or unconsciously, the system is biased. Over the last year, the Met's use of force has increased, with black people nearly four times more likely to have it used on them than their white counterparts. Despite the global pandemic, 
Thousands came to central London to march against deaths, black deaths, in police custody. We've really got to be here to appreciate the size of this and to feel the strength of feeling here, really. And people from all backgrounds have turned out today, all ages. But there's one message, that there needs to be big changes. Beautiful to see the United Colours out here and everybody's here in support of injustice and inequality, because that's what it boils down to at the end of the day. You know, any decent human being can and should acknowledge that what's been happening is not right and it's happening on our own home soil. For Amari, this public protest is also deeply personal. On the 31st of August 2010, his best friend Shaney admitted himself into Bethlehem Royal Hospital for mental health treatment. But after being restrained by 11 police officers, he never regained consciousness. His brain had been starved of oxygen. It was awful, worst time of my life. Shaney, my best friend, was killed in 2010 at the hands of um, up to 11 police officers and the details were horrific. It was, it was disgusting. How can you tie him up while he's on the floor, sit on him, on his back? He couldn't breathe. A decade on, and the marches following George Floyd's death hold a haunting resonance for Shaney's mum. I don't, I don't watch it. I can't watch it because the very thing Shaney was saying, I can't breathe, is what happened with George, George Floyd. Many other families, predominantly black, but we have heard our loved ones say, I can't breathe. I remember when Shaney was buried, somebody said how auspicious an almond tree is. Visiting Shaney's resting place offers some peace to Shaney's parents, but they say their pain remains unhealed, partly because of the legal process following his death. Even though the inquest in 2017 found that the force used was unnecessary unreasonable and excessive, a misconduct hearing cleared the officers involved. You don't feel as if there's any justice, really. You don't feel it. It's impossible. Yeah. And that's what, you know, pains, really. Yeah. Rashan Charles's family believed that justice would be forthcoming at the inquest into his death. I sat through every day, every minute of the coroner's inquest, St Pancras, but I didn't realise that they were going to tell me and the nation that what you see on this CCTV isn't happening. In June 2018, the inquest concluded that the officer's use of force was justified and that Rashan's death was a consequence of a package he had inserted in his mouth, blocking his airway. The officer is not found guilty of any misconduct, so I hear that, I note it, but I am entitled to my professional opinion. There are good officers doing work across London and across the country. There are also officers who are letting the police service and society down. That's my stance. In a number of cases, um, public inquiries have been held or coroners have had inquiries and they've come to the conclusion that um, somebody was responsible either unlawfully for killing that person or neglected to protect them. And yet, despite all of that, nobody has ever been convicted of a murder or manslaughter in, since records began in relation to a death in custody. And should they have been? In my experience, Tyra, juries are loath to convict an officer. Seemingly, the evidence threshold has to be even higher than it would be 
for a normal civilian. And that shouldn't be the case, but that seems to be what's happening. I don't trust you, mate. You've got a uniform on. Very, very small numbers of individuals who come into our custody suites end up tragically dying. And there's a whole range of factors that can uh, come to play. People often present with illness. People often have Ill illness episodes whilst in custody. Um, sometimes force has to be used to ensure that processes can be followed. Families, understandably, I think, want to be able to identify an individual who is responsible for the death of their loved one. But very often, as we've seen through the various cases uh, over the years, it isn't the actions of an individual that can be attributed to the death. There's a, a range of small things that, through a, a coming together of those small things, end up in a tragedy. As tensions have risen, angry scenes have erupted in what's largely been a wave of peaceful protests. This moment, Black Lives Matter, feels like a new movement, but actually, we've been here before. 50 years ago, Notting Hill's black community marched on the streets following allegations of police brutality and racism. Ten years later, the Brixton riots erupted after an area already blighted by high unemployment and poor housing became the target of tough policing measures. It's not just communities that have accused the police of racial bias. In 1998, following the murder of Stephen Lawrence, Lord Macpherson's report branded the Met institutionally racist. But discrimination still persists today. And according to official data, if you're black, you're four times more likely to be stopped and searched. I gave evidence at the Macpherson inquiry. At that time, you're 15 times more likely to be um, arrested and charged and kept in, in custody, if you're black than you're white. More likely to be involved in an aggressive arrest and violence is used by the officer. Now we are 20 odd years later and it's more or less the same. And, and I remember even in those days, a, a sense of dread when you heard a siren, you know, because you felt, boy, that means trouble. It's very similar to what I see with our young people with our Voids program and what they talk about, you know, feeling over-policed and under-protected, not getting a sense of partnership with, with, with police. And we train them to work with police and other authority figures. So if, for me, it, if, we not, if we don't get the grip uh, uh, and leadership from the top, we're going to see certain officers being emboldened, think they can do anything they want, it's untouchable and, you know, at any expense. The, the board of trustees Former Met Police Superintendent Leroy Logan founded Voyage Youth in Hackney 20 years ago. A police officer should treat you with respect, not strip you in the middle of the street. These sessions are designed to help young people know their rights if they're stopped and searched, to try and prevent such interactions ending in the use of police force. If you give them an understanding of why police do what they do and how they do it and how to get the best out of that encounter, then hopefully Others will say, well, actually, they've dealt with it well, the officer was nice to them, and then that will create a more positive um, perception of stop and search. But I've been speaking to former and current Met officers who have told me that attempts to build relations are being undermined by racist attitudes and actions in the force. When on the street, black kids aren't seen as children, they speak to them like they're adults. They say things like, well, we explain the law to him, and I say, but he's a child. They arrest them because they think they're older. One officer, who's been on the beat in London for several years, felt compelled to speak out about the racism that they've witnessed in the Met. We agreed to protect their identity. They're more aggressive with us because they find us scary. And they're heavy-handed and they don't listen if someone has an accent. They just shout, I can't understand you. As far as they're concerned, black people are more aggressive. Their voices are more hoarse or heavy. When they're upset, they should calm them down. But instead, they're keen to put their hands on first because it's fight or flight. Particularly with black men, 
If a black person is upset saying it's hurting, they say it looks fine to me. They can't see bruises. If you've never seen black skin, you don't see the bruising. They can't see them going red. I'm sad to say that I, I feel the whole look and feel of policing, um, how you get incidences of officers being just devaluing and dehumanising certain communities, especially black communities. It's obvious that certain people, when they're in that adrenaline-driven moment and they're seeing red, as it were, they don't know their boundaries. It doesn't affect communities for a few years. It will do so for generations. If they tell you that for years they have loved ones who have been stopped, searched or died in police custody, that's not going to go away fast time. It also makes it impossible for officers who are doing a fantastic job because they're out there in almost impossible circumstances. They mean well, they're working hard, but other officers have made the terrain impossible because of the things they have done and because of the things they're currently doing. Police are investigating a triple stabbing. In carrying out their duties, the police tow a fine line between safeguarding and alienating communities. The Mets say they don't always get it right, but they want the public to see things from their perspective. The, the perception is, is, is there, isn't it, that every time you see a police interaction with a young black man, it, and it's in your community, if that's what you see regularly, I can understand that you would start to think there's something going on here. But all I would encourage people to do is to look at the broader piece. We use force responsibly, and when we misuse it, we're held to account. Even before this movement, the treatment of black people in police custody was a matter of intense scrutiny. A government commissioned review in 2017 found that the colour of your skin has a measurable impact on how you're dealt with at every stage in the justice system. Nathan Ade has direct experience of just how brutal the system can be. My dad's experience of police brutality has made me um, upset and very, like, disgusted. His daughter, Afia, recently wrote a poem after discovering that her father nearly died in a prison cell. Police brutality is an issue until recently it hasn't been known and talked about much and everyone kind of been living under a rock not knowing about it of how the system is and how we live in the world. In October 2013, whilst working as a minicab driver at Heathrow Airport, Nathan was pulled over by two police officers who suspected him of taxi touting. Despite the company he worked for confirming by phone that he was there to do a legal pickup, the police decided to arrest him. Why would six, seven, eight, nine police officers be on top of somebody who has already been handcuffed on the floor? Why? I was powerless. In the space of three, four minutes, there was about six more officers. All of them has got my face on the ground. The officer who put the handcuff on me was using his uh, right knee like that on top of my chest. All that I remember is the van was, the back of the van was open. They were throwing me like that to the van and my forehead here hit the side of the door and I passed out. I didn't remember anything at all from that side. This is the CCTV footage of the moment Nathan was restrained. When my eyes got open, my face was on the floor of a cell. Half of my shirt is covered with blood and my breathing was cutting off. I, I didn't think I was going to survive. It took several hours before the police finally took Nathan to hospital. These photos taken two days after he was allowed home show his wounds. Seven years on, he says he still bears some of the scars, but they're psychological. I'll come home, I don't want to see anybody. I just want to be alone and there's few times I just have to cry myself to sleep. There's few times I just have to cry myself to sleep. I don't want to see my children, I don't want to see anybody. And during this time, there was about three occasions 
I did contemplate a suicide. I spoke to my GP about it. Nathan was charged with resisting arrest, biting an officer and illegally promoting his business. Yet he says there was no way he could disprove any of these accusations and was even warned by two solicitors that as a black man up against the Met, the odds were stacked against him. But then Nathan's father-in-law decided to help him fight. The absence of any independent witnesses to speak up for Nathan uh, meant that uh, we, we were really going to have to pull the stops out. Alan paid for Nathan's legal support and even managed to obtain CCTV footage of the arrest. We found a little bit of him being carried to the van and it completely contradicted the account that the police had put together. At the trial, the outcome, in my view, was very simple. The evidence didn't really add up. A magistrate's court dismissed all charges against Nathan. A 2017 government commissioned review suggested 35 changes to the criminal justice system to try and stop incidents like that endured by Nathan and his family. Yet three years on, hardly any of those recommendations have been implemented. We must have more um, police officers and more senior police officers from minority backgrounds. We must have uh, many more judges and magistrates from minority backgrounds. You need to hear more from victims' voices. So if they tell you that there is an issue around death in custody or an issue around um, uh, arrest or whatever it may be, you respond to that. And you look at how you're going to change it and you change it. I think that the selection process needs to change significantly. And uh, the Commissioner may well say that it has changed. And I will agree that there's no foolproof way of eliminating all people who treat people as inferior or treat people badly. But those people who do find a way to get through the system, they telegraph their, their behaviour day in, day out in the police service. And what it needs are for the senior managers to say there's no place for you in this organisation. We have a very robust discipline process and if there's any allegations of racism, uh, direct or indirect, those are investigated and if officers are found to have breached standards of professional, sta uh, professional standards in terms of their attitudes towards individual groups, then they're dealt with. For families that have lost a loved one in police custody or those that have been injured following the use of force, it's often the sense of police impunity that's most difficult. Not only are officers almost never convicted, many don't even face any internal disciplinary action. I think the police feel they are not accountable to anybody. And even if you want to hold them into account, the system has been fenced against them taking accountability of what they do. After he was cleared of all charges at the magistrate's court, Nathan lodged a complaint with the police and the IOPC. Their investigations concluded that there was no case to answer for the officers involved. The organisation that's supposed to hold the police to account say they can only do so much. I recognise the issues around discrimination personally through lived experience. I recognise the challenges and concerns voiced by black communities. If we identify any criminality, what we do is we refer the case to the Prime Prosecution Service. Then ultimately, if it goes to a trial, the ultimate decision is made by a judge and jury. So while we, while we most certainly occupy a really important place in the criminal justice system, we are part of a wider system and there is a limit to our powers.
these are my children. I, I have a duty to try and change things for the next generation to come, that they don't have to experience the inequalities and oppression and injustice that I had to. People have to listen, people have to do something. Um, and that's how I can I manage each day, with a little hope and um, a prayer. That's all. Yeah, I think it will, you know, maybe not in my lifetime, but I hope in my lifetime, but definitely in my grandson's lifetime, yeah.